is the third um, series of webinars about um, the solutions in high density interconnect. Um, my name is Happy Holden. Um, I've been in this industry for over 55 years, am retired now, but I still uh, continue to um, contribute to the industry and I'm a technical editor in iConnect 007 for the magazines that we put out each month um, and the other books. For those of you that are only tuning into this uh, third webinar, uh, Lucy tells me that the first two webinars um, available um, are, since they've been recorded like we're recording this one, you can uh, go to Sierra Circuits and uh, replay the earlier seminars, uh, as well as, uh, you know, if you signed up for this, then Lucy will be sending you a copy of the overhead presentations. Yes, uh, we will. and uh, you can find the on-demand webinars we did previously on our website under resources, resources, on-demand webinars. And, and let me mention that there are a lot of resources available there at Sierra Circus, not just uh, software solutions to help you on design and other things, but also uh, if you have questions of, about design, you can put them on the forum. And uh, uh, they also have a, a number of books available that you can download for free, which is useful to have in your library. With nothing else, we'll get started. Um, the agenda is um, kind of a short introduction and uh, I'll talk about signal integrity and power integrity advantages with high density interconnect and a little bit of high density interconnect design planning and the awareness of new HDI materials and how it affects power integrity and the power distribution network. Um, these newer processors that you can see here have not only a lot of pins in interconnect, but um, like this one is in the turbo mode, is 280 watts dissipation um, requiring nearly 200 amps at its 3.2 gigahertz clock um, with three memory channels that are DDR6s at 1.6 gigahertz, but only 1.4 <clears throat> volts. Um, and so the power distribution network design affects the high frequency performance of many of today's most advanced chips and the uh, impedance requirements may be calculated using the form of the flow of the, the impedance Z of the power just is equal to the percent ripple times the voltage divided by the current maximum. Um, whereas on this quad core, um, if you're looking for, uh, in a, if you had a need for um, only having a 1% ripple on the 1.4 volt voltage rail at the maximum 200 amp current, uh, you would need a power distribution network impedance of 0 0.007 ohms. Um, if you were able to accept 5% ripple, then it would be uh, 0.035 ohms with that. Um, but um, as we go to smaller and smaller uh, transistor geometries uh, on the most advanced chips, uh, there also there's a need on the band gap to reduce the voltage. So voltage are dropping down to one volt and below one volt, while current is still high. And so this power display impedance is an important uh, requirement on the design for any of the high frequency, high performance boards, um, and it's difficult to maintain. So it's one of the things that we'll address today. The other level is the whole system level interconnect. If you've got a signal going from driver A um, all the way to receiver B, and you have some kind of motherboard, daughter board, backplane type configuration going from A to B, um, with the rise times available um, on the current set of performance chips, um, 
all of these parasitics that you see here in terms of inductances and competences um, are now part of that electrical path from A to B. And with slower rise times, we could ignore all these. And unfortunately today, uh, we can't ignore these parasitics. And, and so, you know, this is many times the essential of signal integrity is managing all of these many parasitics. Um, and that's because as you've heard before, uh, in a, a square wave doesn't really kind of exist uh, in nature. The square wave is made up of many, many fundamental frequencies and harmonics. And as that square wave rise time and fall time drops, um, you know, from one nanosecond to 150 picoseconds or even smaller, um, that then is made up, its harmonic content is made up of all the different frequencies out to 1800 megahertz, if you've seen there. And that then produces all kinds of potential signal integrity issues and problems, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, because we're talking about high density interconnect, um, this is the first microvia board in volume production that, that I found um, uh, up and, and this was uh, produced in 1982. Um, and an interesting thing about HDI is that HDI was not invented due to density. It was invented because in 1982, we had this um, NMOS3 um, chip, which you see in the middle of the figure there. The first time that um, we had a complete 32-bit microprocessor on a single chip. Um, you might know of this as the Pentium, um, since the uh, Pentium um, and Intel was a partner of Hewlett Packard. Um, but the before the Pentium was this, what we call the focus uh, chip. And when we put this on our first printed circuit board uh, and everything and fired it up, it didn't work. Now the chip was working, um, but the system wasn't working. And we discovered much to our problem that this um, three dimensional transistors and the, the NMOS3 architecture we were using uh, produced a successful microprocessor, but it could not drive the inductance of a, a, a through hole, a 13,000 diameter in a 62,000 board, um, the through hole inductance is about 18 nano henrys. Um, nor um, would it drive FR4 material with a dielectric constant of 0 0.008. Um, and because of that, um, the engineers did a back calculation uh, based on some uh, uh, chip test parameters and came back and said that, well, we can only drive a 25 pico Henry via, which happens to be a five mils in diameter and about five mils deep or 125 micron in diameter, 125 micron deep. And that the loss tangent of the material has to be 0 0.0004. Um, in other words, the board has to be built out of PTFE Teflon. Um, and on top of that, um, this NMOS3 is really power hungry. It has the heat dissipation of a nuclear reactor. Um, and so as you can see there, the uh, um, it's put into a cavity and technically bonded to a metal core of this 